One last drink of water. <laughs> okay, take your Bibles with me and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Every Christian who lives a godly life experiences a certain amount of persecution. You know, it's not a topic I like to talk about and to think about because really no one enjoys that sort of thing. But we can't, we have to look at that topic once in a while because there are going to be times we're going to face some persecution. And how are we going to deal with that? Someone said, a faith that can, can't be tested can't be trusted. So God's going to test your faith with different things, such as maybe some time of suffering, time of persecution, uh, for various reasons. But one reason could be just to see how strong you are. How committed are you to the cause of Christ? Or, you know, Sometimes you're, someone also said, you know, you are only as strong as what it takes to stop you. All right? Whatever it takes to stop you, that's how strong you are. And so what we want to see here today in this passage is that Peter talked about some persecution that was coming to these churches in Asia Minor. Okay, that's the, those places that we read there in chapter 1. Uh, these are, this is modern-day Turkey, okay? So you kind of get an idea where these are at. And we do know from history that Peter is just on the brink here of uh, the, the timing of uh, some persecution of the early church because of the Roman Emperor Nero. Of course, his mode of persecution was to burn believers at the stake, all right? That was his mode. He, and uh, it is said that he would take those Christians and burn them, and they lighted the court in Rome, his court in Rome. So just a very severe persecution. And Peter uh, may have thought, well, you know, just because we're not in Rome, just because we're not in Italy, doesn't mean that couldn't happen here. And so he was giving some warning. And we see that in chapter 4 and verse 12. Notice what he says here. He says, Beloved, he's talking to believers. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. So the fiery trial, that is to try you. And, you know, that could be a double reference, couldn't it? Could be the type of persecution. They may be, you know, from historical reasons that we know that they were burnt. Christians were burned at the stake. That type of trial, fiery, literal burning, but also a, a, a spiritual burning, a trying, a, a uh, you know, testing that God can be doing in your life. And he says, you need, to, you need to realize that could be coming. And he wanted them to be prepared. And so in this passage, verses 12 to 19, I want to look at four instructions that Peter gave to help these believers during this time of persecution. And I think they're relative for today. Now, definitely, I don't think we're in that type of persecution, uh, in that type of way. But, you know, persecution can come, suffering can come in many different ways. And so, how do we respond to any form of suffering? That's what we want to look at here this morning as we look at this passage. So let's look at these quickly. Four instructions that I have here that Peter gave. Number one, one instruction was to expect suffering. Expect it. Notice it says here, uh, and he said, think it not strange. And then he concluded, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Think it not strange. And that's, you know, in other words, expect it. Because why? Well, there's two reasons I have why we can kind of expect this to face some persecution in, our, in this world. Number uh, one reason, we live among a sinful world. 
And when I mean sinful word, world, I'm talking about the fact that we live among unbelievers, people who are not saved. And because of their, because of their unbelief and they don't have uh, Jesus Christ as their Savior, they don't have what we have. We have the Lord. <laughs> And we got the Holy Spirit, and we, got, we have all of this that God's given us, but they don't have that. And so they're going to respond to life a, a, a lot differently than we are. And you know, just because we're Christians, uh, we face difficult things, right? We all face those things. We're not, we're, we're not special, so we have to face those things. They have to face those things, right? I mean, they're facing them just like we're facing them. The question is, how do they respond? Well, most likely, some of them, I can't say all of them, but some of them, they get mad at God. They do. Because of one reason or another, they get mad at God, they blame God for their troubles. He is the one that they blame, and so therefore, anybody that's associated with God, well, you can expect they're going to take it out on you, maybe, sometimes. Because of your relationship with the Lord. Because of their anger at God. And you know, this is the way it is through Scripture. It's always been like this. You can go back to Genesis chapter 4. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? Remember how Cain was angry at his brother? Did his brother do anything to deserve that anger? No, what happened? Cain was mad at God because God refused to accept his sacrifice because it wasn't a blood sacrifice that was to represent the shedding of blood on the cross by our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now Abel, he had obeyed and offered that blood sacrifice, but Cain did not. So Cain got mad at God and took it out on Abel. And Abel suffered. He murdered his brother. And the Bible tells us that, explains that to us. Keep that place there in 1 Peter and go over just a few books to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. He's talking about loving your brother, that we need to love our brother. If we can't love our brother, then something's wrong with our salvation. Our, and he's talking about our brother in Christ. But notice what he says. He kind of uses this illustration of Cain and Abel. He says here, verse 12, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. If you're going to follow God and obey him, there's going to be some people that don't like it. And, they, and because of their anger at God and whatever reason, they may take it out on you. So that's one reason we can kind of expect it. It's just the sinful world in which we live. Another reason is it's a part of God's plan. What? <laughs> God, God has got a plan for suffering? Wow. Well, notice what he says here. In that last part of verse 12, he says, As though some strange things happened unto you. God, there's nothing in this life that just happenstance. Okay? There's a plan. There's a plan. And even when the evil things happen to us, it can work out to God's plan. And even suffering. God can take that which is evil and bad and make it good. And that's what Peter's saying here. There's some laws in nature, isn't there? There's some things that will just happen. Okay? That will just happen because of the laws of nature God has placed. Like, you take some seeds and plant them in your garden... And if everything's the right conditions are good, what are you going to have? You're going to have a harvest, right? You're going to have a, a harvest in the fall. Well, that's kind of like it is with suffering. 
we have an enemy. His name is Satan. And Satan hates God's people. He hates them. He hates God. He hates God's people. He'll do whatever he can to stop them and keep them. But, praise the Lord, our God shall prevail. Right? He is not going to be held back by Satan. And even though Satan may cause some suffering in our life, it's not going to hold back God from taking care of us and through the suffering receive the glory. Amen. What they meant for evil and to, you know, to destroy God, God turns it around and makes it for good. Amen. That's God. And that's what Jesus said, didn't he? He said that. Uh, again, keep your place in Peter. We're going to come back there. Uh, go to John chapter 16, verse 33. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. Who, who Jesus knew were going to face all this persecution. He understood that. He had that. It was all part of the plan. And notice what he says. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The world's not going to win. And who's the God of this world? Satan. And they're not going to win. So we can expect it. Because of the God of this world, because of the ungodly of this world, expect it, he says. Number two, another instruction was to rejoice. And suffering. Now, this part is totally beyond my comprehension. Okay? Uh, suffering and rejoicing to me does not go together. But, thank God, there's the Spirit of God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit who overrides all of my thinking. Okay? And takes over during times of suffering. To where, yeah. A person, a Christian who's suffering for the cause of Christ can rejoice. And we notice here, why can we rejoice? Well, Peter gives three, three uh, reasons. Number one, our suffering means fellowship with Christ. When we're suffering, we're actually following in the steps of our Savior, Jesus Christ, because He suffered for us. That's what he says in verse 13. But rejoice. And if you look at verses 12, uh, 13 and 14, the form of rejoicing or joy is found four times. All through this time of suffering, all right, this description of suffering and reasons for suffering, he mentions some type of rejoicing four times. He says, But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of the sufferings of Christ. So when we are going through that suffering, we are following in the steps of the Lord. And we can rejoice. Now, is there any evidence or any example of Christians who rejoice when they were suffering? Yeah, in the Bible. Remember the apostles, the early days of the church, and the Jewish Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, the law of the land of Israel. They didn't like it. They didn't like these Christians. They didn't like them preaching about Jesus. And they wanted them to stop. And they arrested them. And they told them to stop. And the Bible says they beat them in Acts chapter 5. But when they let them loose, the Bible says they returned rejoicing that they could suffer for the Lord's sake. So they, they, they understood that they were part of that fellowship with the Lord. They could identify with what Christ went through for them. And they were glad to do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, but our suffering means glory in the future. Glory in the future. Notice it says in verse 13, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. Are there times when suffering is transformed to joy? Is there times like that in the world? How about the maternity ward? Hmm. 
There's a place of great pain. Great pain. Pain and suffering. I won't say wailing and gnashing of teeth, but I think it comes pretty close. But at that same place, what's, when that baby is delivered, when the time has come, there is great joy. Great joy. Because, you know, that gift has been presented. The reward. How about on the podium at a sporting event? The athlete, he comes to enter that event, the years of training, all the suffering, all the things that they went through to get to that place, and they agonize through that event. And if they are victorious, that suffering and that ch struggle that they went through, all of that has been transformed to great joy because they won and they received the, the prize. Yeah, there are things in life that, through, you know, there is great pain and struggle and suffering, but in the end, it's transformed to great joy. Well, the same is true for us as believers. If, if you have been chosen to suffer for the cause of Christ, there is going to be a reward for you. And your, your pain and suffering and everything you go through, one day it will be revealed when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and there will be reward and there will be great joy and you'll be so thankful I was faithful and that's a, you know that's a joy that that Peter says it's exceeding joy I mean it's beyond imagination you cannot comprehend the joy those martyrs and those people who suffer for the cause of Christ what they will experience when they see the Savior, Jesus Christ. Exceeding joy. And then our suffering enables us to glorify His name. We can glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Notice it says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Okay? Happy are ye. A little bit farther down, we see the word Christian. In verse 16. Okay, Christian. Now today, a Christian, uh, really, what does it mean? It can mean to some people, uh, I've, I've, I've talked to people from uh, different places, and uh, they say, oh, I'm, I'm Christian. In the, in the fact that they're not some other, other religion. Okay, so I'm Christian. I'm not, you know, if they were from East India, it would be, I'm Christian, I'm not Hindu. Right? That's a, it's just a term of, just to, to show the difference. You know, I'm not of that group. Doesn't necessarily mean they're saved, but there's just categorizes them. Right? That's what it is. It's just a category. Uh, but in the Bible times, when someone called you a Christian, it was a reproach in the first century. Oh, yeah, look at those Christians. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of Christians. Look at them. Now, what did it mean? It meant a follower of Christ or a little Christ. And it wasn't to be uh, given as a, uh, you know, to be nice. It was to talk down to them and to reproach them. And Peter says... If you're a reproach for the name of Christ, don't get upset about it. Be happy. Be happy. Because you know what? They're making fun of Christ. They're making fun of you. But you know what? Jesus Christ is being glorified. That's what he says here in verse 16. He says, I'm sorry, verse 14, For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So what did the Christian church do in the first century? They just accepted it. You're going to call us Christians? Yeah, we'll accept the term. You're saying in, you're, you're, you're being derogatory to us, you're, you're, being, uh, you're reproaching us, we'll accept it. Yeah, we, we'll take your reproach that we might glorify the Savior, then lift Him up. We'll gladly do that. So they took the name Christian. 
And they accepted it and wore it because to them they were glad to be reproached that God might be glorified. And they accepted it. And that's what we can do when we suffer. We can, ex we can say, you know what, I'm going to enable this suffering and use it to glorify my Savior, Jesus Christ. And then another instruction was to examine your life when suffering. Notice it says in verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, Peter understood that sometimes Christians make mistakes. And sometimes we're not perfect. And when we're hurting, sometimes we want to lash out. And that's just human nature, isn't it? To lash out. To return evil for evil. And sometimes when we're suffering, that's how we respond. So Peter says, well, you know, if you're suffering because you responded in a certain way that was very, you know, of the old nature, you're fulfilling the lust of your flesh, the anger and the bitterness. If that was coming out and you're suffering, well, you know, accept it because you're doing it because of your own mistakes. It's not because of Christ. So we should ask ourselves, why are we suffering? Am I suffering for Christ, or am I just suffering because of my sin, my mistakes? Because that's the difference. That's not the same. And then he says, our suffer, uh, rather, uh, we need to ask, am I ashamed or glorifying Christ? And it says here, we talked a little bit about it before, but in verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God on his behalf. Sometimes, you know, we're not as brave as we think we are, are we? Oh, we like to think, well, hey, if that ever happened to me, this is how I'll respond. I'll stand up for the Lord. I'll witness for the Lord. I'll, you know, I'm not going to be like them. I'm going to be different. <laughs> now, be careful. That's pride. And who knew that better than Peter? Right? Was there a time in Peter's life when he was ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yeah. When the Lord was being tried that night before his crucifixion, and Peter was around the fire warming himself, and there was people saying, I know you. I recognize you. You're a follower of Christ. No, I'm not. <laughs> Not once, but three times. And oh, how he felt about that. He was so discouraged and so downtrod. He went out and wept, the Bible says. But did the Lord forgive him and give him a second chance? Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to get it right every time. So if you must, you know, let's, let's understand that. You say, well, I've failed in many areas. I, I, there's been times when I have been ashamed. Listen, don't let that get you down. We're all guilty. We all make the mistakes. But you know what? Just learn from it. And ask the Lord for strength and find out, what do we find? No, we're not strong. <laughs> we're weak. That's where we need the Lord's help. That's where we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because it takes great strength to stand up for Christ. Especially in a world like this. And so, are we glorifying Christ? Am I glorifying Christ with my life and what I'm doing and suffering and dealing with all this, am I able to glorify the Lord? If, if not, then go to the Holy Spirit. He'll give you strength. The Lord will give you strength to do that. And then ask, am I seeking to win the lost? Am I seeking to win the lost? Notice it says in verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. All right, he's talking about us, Christians. All right, he's talking about the church. The house of God. And you know, as we've said before, Christians are going to suffer. We're going to face these things. So understand that. And you may say, well, why would God cause us to suffer? We're His children. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride. Why are we suffering? Well, He has a purpose. He has a purpose because we're the house of God. We're his, because He does love us. And He cares about us. And He wants the best for us. 
But he also wants us to have an impact on this world. And sometimes when we suffer, we can be a light to those around us. You know, living in this world unsaved, with all the, the light that's with them, that the unsaved have, they still don't get it. They still don't get it, do they? <laughs> they're, they're lost. They're still blinded. Why? It's tough. The lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the world, the pride of life, Satan has just blinded them to that light that's out there, and they can't see it. So what's going to get their attention? How are they going to see it? I'm not saying everyone, but some of them, they see the light when the church suffers, when the church goes through some difficult times, and they're, they're, they're woken up or they're moved through that to say, hey, wow, there is, there is something here. There is the gospel. I am lost, and I need Christ, and that wakes them up so that they might get saved. And you know what? What greater, what greater reason to suffer? If you're going to suffer, what greater reason to suffer than to bring someone to Christ so that they may know eternal life? What greater reason? And you know what? God knows that. Our Savior knows that. And that's what kind of Peter's trying to explain here to them. He says, he goes on to say, and if first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Who are they? That's the lost. They obey not the gospel. They're, they're unsaved. Well, what, where, what, what, what judgment are they going to face? The, the great white throne judgment, where they'll hear, depart from me, I never knew you, and thrown into the another fire. The lake of fire. Verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, I mean, if it was hard for us, how many times did you hear the gospel before you got saved? Oh. If it was hard for us, wow, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? Well, we know where they'll appear, as I said, <laughs> before the fire. So sometimes God would have us suffer so that we can be a light, a light to the lost. And that's what Jesus said, didn't he? He said, let your light so shine among men, right? That we might, uh, that we might be that light, that they may see your good works and they may come to know Christ as Savior. And then number four, the final instruction was to commit yourself to God. Notice it says in verse 19, Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Someone said this, When we are suffering in the will of God, we can commit ourselves to the care of God. What's the word commit? The word commit means safekeeping. All right? Where do you take your money? To be safe the bank that's what I've learned I used to keep in my top drawer of my dresser but then I got robbed and I says that's not very safe anymore <laughs> so I went taking that to the bank we got a safety deposit box and we put it there because the bank is a safe place and not only that but not only is the bank a safe place in most cases but the bank also rewards when you put your money, right? You can invest your money and they'll take your money and you know, you might get a dividend. You might get an interest. You might make some interest on that money. There's some rewards. And so when we commit our valuables, our money to them, there's safekeeping and there's reward. What Peter is saying is this, commit your life to the Creator. Why? Why should I commit my life to him because he'll keep you safe he'll keep you safe not only in a, a you know 
You say, well, if I'm suffering, that's not very safe. Well, you know, let's remember this. Uh, there's a spiritual as well. And we know once we're saved, we're not going to lose our salvation. We're safe until we get to heaven. And, he's, and we are kept in his hands. And not only that, but even through this world, and when we suffer or whatever we go through, our creator has not only just created this world, but he is sustaining us. Isn't it interesting? Peter didn't say, well, well, commit yourself to the Savior. No, he said, commit yourself to the Creator. The one who created you and who sustains you and will keep you until the end. And what happens when we get to the end? We'll be rewarded for our faithfulness. In conclusion here today, Therefore, as we aim to continually do what is right in the Savior's eyes, let's keep our rejoicing in the Lord and our, ho our hope firmly set on Christ's return. A lot of times when people suffer, we ask the word, why? Why am I suffering? And that's just natural. Why am I suffering? Why am I going through this? Well, Peter says the better word is, how will I respond to suffering? How? Will I get upset? Will I get mad? Will I get bitter? That's not the purpose. The purpose is that we would be better. A better light. A better Christian. So that we can glorify our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to focus on when we're suffering. Focus on the Lord. And that's what we read, didn't we? In 1 Peter chapter 1. We read there in verse Six, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, just for a short period, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, you're suffering, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire or refined, okay, the refining of this suffering, refining of what you're going through to make you better, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Christ is coming soon. And so God will sustain you and keep you until Jesus comes again. And that's our hope, our hope in Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, again, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all that he's done. Now bless us now, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take... Uh, well, let's stand